Hello everyone and welcome to YouTube lecture number 14. This is actually part two. Uh, earlier today I put up the first part of this, Settling the West. That was on homesteaders. Uh, this one is on the Plains Indian Wars. You may have noticed I do not have any music here and that's really on purpose. I feel this is a fairly sensitive type subject and I didn't think music would really be all that appropriate. Uh, throughout our discourse of U.S. history, we've been talking about conflict uh, between Europe at first with Native Americans and then specifically with the British and then later with the American colonists and then the new nation of America. It seems like there's always conflict between the two peoples. Uh, the last time we talked about Indians in earnest was during Andrew Jackson's presidency and the infamous Indian Removal Act of 1830, which forced Indians to leave their homelands in the east and travel west across the Mississippi, again given guarantees that they would have this land. Well, with the Civil War coming and eventually over, uh, the United States government begins to think differently on this, and a series of wars will take place that we collectively call the Plains Indians Wars. And that's what I'll be talking about with you here for the next few moments. So another clash of culture will happen yet again. Um, so as I was saying here, after the Civil War, we get the Great West, uh, this, uh, the Great American Desert, I believe as I introduced it in the other video, uh, this prairie land that had been the home of these nomadic Indians, multiple tribes out here, the most famous, the Cheyenne and the Sioux Indian. Uh, the Arapaho Indian, the Pueblo Indians, the Nass Pierce Indians, uh, Crow Indians. Um, but the Cheyenne and the Sioux are the ones I'm going to predominantly be talking about here today. Uh, this was their natural habitat. They were nomadic tribes. They, they traveled the migration patterns of the buffalo. Buffalo was everything to them. Their entire culture uh, revolved around buffalo. They hunted them, obviously. Uh, they believed that the buffalo willingly gave themselves, their lives to them whenever they caught them and killed them. And if they didn't, they believed that the buffalo was telling them that it will, it's your turn to suffer a little bit. Um, the very spiritual in nature when it came to hunting buffalo. And they used everything about the buffalo. They used the buffalo meat, the buffalo muscles, buffalo bones, the organs, the, the skin and the pelts. Everything was used in their society. Uh, everything from creating clothing and blankets to creating weapons. Uh, their bowstrings were made from the muscles of buffalo. Uh, organs were ground up and uh, bone and used to create paints and dyes. Uh, everything about the buffalo was utilized by these people. And this is pretty much why the United States government decides on a policy of buffalo extinction. Uh, knowing full well that the Indian entire culture revolved around the bison, uh, the American government believed that the best way then to eliminate the Indians would be to eliminate buffalo. And, they, and this is what they do over the next several decades. They nearly hunt, the United States government that is, nearly hunts buffalo into extinction. Uh, wild horses. Uh, horses were introduced into this part of the world by Spain. When they began to conquer Mexico, uh, they brought horses with them. And eventually horses became... Uh, you know, as certain Spaniards let horses go, we had wild horses. We still have, in parts of Southern California and Arizona, wild horses. Uh, but the Indians began to tame them and became excellent at, hor at horse riding. Uh, they utilized the horse, again, for everything apart about their society and transportation and hunting and war. So the horse was also very important to their culture. Uh, your textbook gives this figure of 360,000 Native Americans in the Great Plains area by the time the Civil War is over. Uh, you know what I've always said to you about numbers and figures. You, you really can't trust them. Uh, no one can really take accurate counts at this time period. But, all right, we'll go with this figure that our textbook says. And I think I just broke my hand there. Ouch. Um, uh, the United States government has been making a series of treaties with various tribes now, well, since the very beginning. Going all the way back to uh, colonial period and on, there's always been treaties. But the problem has always been, especially as we got further west and dealt with more nomadic tribes, the American government never understood this culture. If you make a treaty with one chief, does this chief represent every Indian in this particular nation? 
Well, no. This chief perhaps only represents a family tribe, uh, maybe 40 or 50 families. But the entire nation, let's say the Cheyenne people, there are multiple families of Cheyenne. You're dealing with one chief. He probably only represents about 40 or 50 families. But the American government believes, well, this is the president-like of the entire nation of Indians. And that was really never the case. And because of that, you might make a treaty with a certain group of Indians, and they agree that they'll stay in a certain area, let's say a reservation. Well, three or four other chiefs are like, well, we didn't, we didn't sign those treaties. That means nothing to me. And they continue to hunt, and they continue to do the things that are natural to them. And, and, and Americans begin to say that, well, you're breaking treaties. As white settlers will come into the area, pioneers, this brought conflict then with the Indians. And the American government says, well, see, we can't trust Indians. But the Native Americans are like, well, we can't trust the American government because you, you're not learning anything about us. And it will bring yet more and more conflict. Uh, 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty. 1853, you have the Fort Atkinson Treaty. This is the beginning of reservation system. This was designating specific land for Indians to live on out west. But again, it could fall apart for several reasons. As I just mentioned earlier, maybe you don't truly understand who you're signing treaties with. And when another group of Indians did something you didn't like, you'd say, well, they're breaking the treaty. Could be also due to gold. Uh, when gold is discovered, for instance, in the Black Hills of Dakota, uh, all that sacred land, the Black Hills, are sacred to Indians that live there. Um, very spiritual, very religious. Uh, but gold is going to be discovered. And Americans are going to say, well, we don't really recognize your religious faith anyways, and we'll take this land from you. Uh, the Bozeman Trail will be built in areas in, in the Dakotas that go right through the heart of spiritual lands for these Indians that live there. Um, also, simply, uh, when the Homestead Act gets passed, and Americans start to come out here and claim their land, well, some of this is Indian land. Well, as, we, as I showed you in the other PowerPoint with homesteading, they, the entire state of Oklahoma basically is created by taking land away from the Indians that were promised them as their land. And so this would lead to nothing but conflict. Indians would only give up their lands, though, when they were actually promised certain things and sh certain guarantees were given to them. For instance, they'd be left alone to, uh, to have their own culture. Uh, but the American government perhaps may give them things that they need, like medicine, food, winter uh, was coming. They might promise to give them blankets, help them, teach them agricultural uh, process so they could become farmers. Uh, the, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs will be created at this time period. And it turns out to be one of the most corrupt agencies in American history of the 19th century. Uh, later on in class, we're going to talk about President Grant's administration, and there's scandal after scandal takes place while he's president, and one of the biggest scandals is what's known as the Indian Ring. Uh, these men who get involved in this Bureau of Indian Affairs that are supposed to be raising all this federal funds, this money from the federal government to help the Indians, well, they're going to steal this money, and very little help will come to the Indians. So when the Indians stopped getting things that they were promised, this also led to conflict. Uh, collectively, we call these this the Plains Indians War, 1865 to 1890, but there's a series of wars here. Uh, the Red River War that takes place in Texas, that's between the American government and the Comanche and the Apache Indians. You have the uh, Nez Perez Wars takes place, the Cheyenne Wars, uh, Chief Red Clouds War. I mean, there's just a multiple of various wars. So collectively, we've come to call them the Plains Indian Wars. This is actually a picture of Chief Red Cloud, one of the uh, leading chiefs of the time period. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about him in a little bit. I want to talk to you about the Sand Creek Massacre, though, 1864. Uh, one of the um, saddest moments, really, in American history these are Cheyenne Indians uh, who have been promised that they can live in peace in Colorado. Lincoln, President Lincoln, promised them. Chief Black Kettle will get assurances from Lincoln and another chief here, uh, Chief White Antelope, 
were put along this river in Colorado known as the Sand Creek River. And Lincoln sent them an American flag that they would fly at the front of their camp so that everybody knew that these Indians, these Cheyenne Indians here, were peaceful and were living in peace with the American government. Well, Colonel Shivington, this is during the Civil War, 1864, we're about six months away or so before the end of the actual war, he's decided that Indians cannot be trusted, and he lives by that motto, that very disgusting motto, there's, not, there's no good Indian but a dead Indian, and he decides to make war. And on November 29th, 1864, in the morning, he attacks the Sand Creek Village. Now, what is so horribly sad here is that they, the Cheyenne believed that they were in, living in peace. So all the warriors have actually left. They're out hunting buffalo. We only have here right now children, women, and the elderly. Women, children, and the elderly are here, and that's about it. Black Kettle's here. There may be a small handful of warriors who've stayed behind, and this is a surprise attack in the morning. Uh, the Indians were totally taken by surprise, and they are going to be massacred. They are literally going to be massacred. Hundreds of Indians are going to be shot dead here. Uh, pregnant mothers will be shot and killed. Uh, little children will be shot. Chief Black Kettle tries to stop and tries to explain to the armies that are coming in here that they're living in peace. He will be shot, but he actually will survive. Um, there will be some survivors. Uh, if I remember in class, I have in my classroom uh, some transcripts from a colonial, invest uh, colonial, I'm sorry, congressional uh, investigation that takes place. Congress does investigate this, and they in fact label this a massacre. But nobody will be charged. Uh, Colonel Shivington will be allowed to quit the army. Um, he will not even be dishonorably discharged. Uh, he will simply leave. And no one will actually be punished for what takes place here, although Congress does declare that this, in fact, was a massacre. So this leads then to the Cheyenne people believing that they cannot trust the American government anymore. Uh, and the Fetterman massacre takes place here two years later. Now, the Captain Fetterman... He makes this very famous boast. He declares, if you give me 50 troopers, I can destroy the entire Cheyenne nation. Now, he is out here in Wyoming looking for Cheyenne. And this is December, very cold, freezing weather. He has about 60, 70 troopers with him, cavalry men on horseback, and a famous Cheyenne warrior by the name of Crazy Horse. He is here. Now, the entire war is known as Red Cloud's War at this time period. That's that Chief Red Cloud I showed you in the picture earlier. Um, but Crazy Horse is one of his, let's say, top lieutenants, if you will, to give it an American type of understanding. Crazy Horse is brilliant, and Crazy Horse wants revenge upon the American army. He comes out and he allows Fetterman's troops to see him on his horse, and they chase after him. They, but this is a trick on the part of the Cheyenne Indians. The American troops, about 60 or so, 60, 70 troopers, they come down into this ravine where you know the ground goes down deep, and they come down in this area surrounded by mountains, and they're now pinned in, and the Cheyenne are waiting for them. And they pounce on the Americans, and they massacre the American troops here. All of Fetterman's men, including him, will be killed <coughs> by Crazy Horse. They then take these men, and again, I know I'm going to put this on tape. I don't want to uh, alarm anyone here, but they crack open their skulls and take out their brains and put them on rocks so their brains freeze onto the rocks. Uh, well, you know what they say about payback, I suppose, and this is what happens. But this, all this does now is escalate the conflict. The American government now is in earnest to end all of the lifestyle of the Cheyenne, the Sioux Indians, the Arapaho, like I said, all of this. And if they won't live on the reservations, then it's going to be war. But every time they would go on the reservations, the Americans would, again, break treaties and take land away from them again. So it, it led to nothing but more and more conflict between the United States government and the Plains Indians. Uh, one of the interesting things about this, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that most of the troopers that will be used out here are 
are in fact black soldiers. Uh, during the American Civil War, Lincoln passed legis had legislation passed that allowed for blacks to finally become official members of the U.S. Army, but they always fought as separate units. While fighting in Texas against Apache Indians, the Apaches referred to the black soldiers as buffalo soldiers. Uh, a kind of honorary thing, in, in a way. Uh, only, only the best warrior could hunt buffalo. And uh, many blacks uh, would stay in the army. They saw this as a way of uh, making a life for themselves. Of course, blacks could not be officers. White officers uh, were in charge of these, uh, these units. Uh, but throughout the 19th century, the, late, the mid to late 19th century and early part of the 20th century, black units would keep this nickname of Buffalo Soldier. Um, I don't have the music with me, but perhaps you can go on YouTube and hear the Bob Marley song that's about Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, maybe a lot of you have been singing that song from time to time, but thinking of it in a maybe a little bit different way since it was Bob Marley. And uh, here I'm giving you a little history lesson on top of it with even some of your reggae music. Who were Buffalo Soldiers and what they really were? Well, they were the black soldiers of the American West um, and throughout America's early history uh, of the late 19th century. I'm sorry, I should say early history. The late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, all right, so the end of the trail. They said, you, these, these Indians are outmanned, they're outgunned. Uh, one of their greatest victories ever, one of the greatest victories in all of Indian history is the Battle of Little Bighorn. It took place between June 25th and June 26th of 1876, the 100th year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, right? Uh, just about a month away. And the American army suffered one of its worst defeats ever at the hands of these Cheyenne and Sioux Indians. Mostly Sioux Indians, but also Cheyenne Indians were here. It's also known as Custard's Last Stand, General George Armstrong Custard. Uh, and I'm not going to go into any great detail, but uh, needless to say, this is the 7th Cavalry under his command. George Custard was one of the youngest men. In fact, he was the youngest man ever to be given this title general, although, in all honesty, it was an honorary title. He actually officially was not a general. He was actually a colonel, but given the honorary title of general. And I can't explain that. Not Never been, been in the military myself, knowing that they don't do that anymore. But that was something that was given to him at the time period. He had about 700 troopers. And he had really felt that uh, he could take on the entire Indian nation by himself He's part of a larger uh, division. There's a General Sheridan out here, for instance. You might have heard of Sheridan Street, where we live, that's named after him. A General Sterling, another street that's, that's here locally. Um, and uh, they're out here, I believe it's known as Operation Sword. Uh, the idea that they're trying to find these Indians in Montana and Wyoming and stop them. They're all trying to head to Canada. They're trying to stop them from getting to Canada. You have uh, Crazy Horse is here, but also another Indian who's not a chief. He's more of a medicine man, a spiritual leader, by the name of Sitting Bull. And Sitting Bull is the one who's having the visions that is leading these Indians, try to get them to Canada to get out of the United States. And the American government tries to stop them. Uh, Custer is, is part of a smaller division of a larger army, and when he found the camp, he was supposed to let the rest of the army know, but he's not going to do that. He believes there's maybe 500, 600 Indians here. He divides his little division of 700 men. He divides them into three. Uh, a major, Reno, is to attack what he thinks is the back door of the village. And Custer is going to attack what he believes is the front door. And a Captain Benteen is to have a third group of men. And they're actually pulled back in reserve as a sweeping motion. In case any Indians had escaped, Captain Banteen would just flush them back into where Custard is. Not really realizing this camp was a massive Indian camp when they got into this area. And there are thousands of Indians here. Uh, perhaps the warriors alone, and again, figures. I, I hate it when I give you figures because you don't really know 100%, but... 
anywhere it's estimated between 900 to 2,500 warriors. Um, and Custard's coming at them with 700 men that he's divided into threes, uh, into three different groups. Not a good idea for Custard. When he comes down this ravine area, he only has a little more than 200 troops with him. He realizes he's not at the front door. He's perhaps somewhere in the middle and tries to get out of there. And within 20 minutes, Custard and all the men with him, including two of his brothers, and I believe he has a brother-in-law or a son-in-law with him, they're, they're all dead. They all die. And General Custard, was he was he was this American hero of the Civil War. He was very well loved by the American populace. Uh, there was some thought that maybe Custer at one point might even make a run for the presidency. And the way he dies uh, just um, enraged the American people. Uh, they began to feel that, uh, that the Indian Wars need to come to an end. And what turns out to be the, Amer the Indians' greatest victory, uh, earlier in the week they also won, won a battle at what is known as Rose Rosebud Creek. So they won two battles here actually. But their greatest victory actually turns into their greatest defeat because the U.S. Army now in full earnest is going to come at them with everything they have, including Gatlin guns and even cannon. And they'll chase the Indians into Canada. Uh, the Indians will begin to starve, and eventually they'll have to surrender. Sitting Bull will surrender. Uh, Red Cloud surrenders. Uh, Crazy Horse will be one of the last. He will surrender. And when he surrenders and comes into the fort, um, he begins to realize that this is probably a trap, and he tries to run away, and he will be grabbed, and he will be stabbed in the back uh, by, uh, by a U.S. trooper. It turns out the trooper is actually an Indian scout of Cheyenne descent himself who stabs Crazy Horse in the back, and Crazy Horse will die that way. Um, and it's just, it's just very, very, very sad. Uh, all this that we've been talking about, the Indians... One of the first historians to actually try to give sense to what Americans have done uh, over the last 100 years is Helen Hunt Jackson. She writes a very famous book at the time period called A Century of Dishonor. And it's all about what the American government has been doing since 1776 up to 1876 with the Battle of Little Bighorn, A Century of Dishonor. Uh, it was a bestseller at the time period. And it really outlined a lot of the atrocities that the American government had been doing to Native people um, and really, really dishonoring the notion of liberty and equality that the United States is supposed to stand for. Now, I have up here 1890, the Battle of Wounded Knee. Uh, that's what some textbooks refer to it as. It's also known as the Massacre of Wounded Knee. Uh, it's considered the very end of the Plains Indian Wars. Uh, Indians have been forced onto reservations in, in Wyoming and Montana, and a Chief Blackfoot uh, has decided that if they got together and did what's called a ghost dance, and you get these Indians together and do a ghost dance, you would eventually resurrect every fallen Indian ever, and they would be able to come back and finally win their wars against the American nation. As this ghost dance begins with just a few dozen and then several dozens and then hundreds of individuals and perhaps upwards of a thousand or more individuals coming here in a place, at a place literally called Wounded Knee, um, the American army arrives. They order uh, Blackfoot and his chiefs to stop this dance to surrender themselves. Uh, many of these chiefs and some of the other Indians do have rifles, but the people doing the ghost dance do not. The American army surrounds them in a circle with Gatlin guns as they're doing their ghost dance. Blackfoot decides to surrender, and he begins to give his guns up, and other chiefs begin to give their guns up. But one of the chiefs, it turns out, was deaf. He couldn't hear, and he wasn't sure what was going on. And when an army officer tried to grab his gun, he fought. And in that fighting, bullets flew. And when that happened, the American army opened up with their Gatlin guns on the crowd dancing their ghost dance, um, killing, killing dozens of individuals. Uh, this is a picture of Blackfoot himself. He is actually 
um, well, he's been shot. He's he's actually dead. This is a famous picture of after the Battle of Wounded Knee, and that is Chief Blackfoot, as he has just been shot dead by the American Army. Um, the American Army, because they put themselves in a circle and began to fire Gatling guns, actually began to kill other Army officers. So the Army, uh, or Army troopers, I should say, the, the, the American casualties here were actually by friendly fire. But this officially ends any of what we collectively again call the Plains Indian Wars. Uh, in 1879, in Pennsylvania, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, they established what they called the Carlisle Indian School. Here they took children of Indians. They took their children, brought them to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and you notice the model, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, they were going to beat the Indians out of them. They were going to teach them to become American citizens, whether they wanted to or not. Um, thousands of young Indian children went through the school system, and then they would be sent back to the reservations to teach their parents English and the ways of America. 1887, uh, a U.S. Senator came up with this, what's called the Dawes Severity Act, named after this person, uh, Senator Dawes. Uh, severity, I mentioned this in the other video, this is uh, land ownership. The idea was break up the idea of Indian reservation. Don't have this big land set aside for Indians to live on. Teach Indians how to own land themselves. This will help them assimilate into the American culture, helping them to become Indians. It's, it's a failure in my eyes. Maybe that's my opinion, but I'm just going to tell you that's how I feel uh, because different individuals took advantage of this and began to take the lands then as they broke up large reservations into smaller reservations and land that was supposed to be set aside for Indians to purchase for themselves would be taken by corporations, by land speculators, by just greedy individuals, and eventually all the land that the Indians had just shrink and shrink and shrink almost to nothing. But this becomes a process. It will be amended several times. Uh, eventually, by the 20th century, we don't have this anymore. Uh, different laws will come in the 20th century that will be more favorable to Indians. And we'll talk about those later on in class. Um, this is a famous painting by Sitting Bull. I mentioned Sitting Bull to you. He was the um, spiritual leader of the, uh, of the Sioux Indians. He was actually what's called a Hunk Papa Sioux. There were Lakota Sioux and Hunk Papa Sioux, and he was a Hunk Papa. And he apparently had a vision of the blue coats attacking and that his people would be victorious. And then he painted this vision. And this he actually painted this before the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And you see here the blue coats coming, and they are dying and falling off of their horse and because his people would be victorious. This vision came true. Well, sometime after many of the battles that would take place and chasing the Indians into Canada, upon his surrender, this will become unknown. And as you see down here, this is a picture that comes from the Smithsonian. I believe this is still hanging in one of the Smithsonian museums. Here is an actual picture of Sitting Bull next to Buffalo Bill Cody. Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, an interesting showman. He is a showman. He creates something called the Wild Wild West Show. He has cowboys and Indians and sharpshooters and dancers and rodeo acts and clowns. And he travels all over America trying to show people what the Wild Wild West was, but it's all really an act. Um, it's an exaggerated form of what is taking place in the West. He will also travel Europe. Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody becomes extremely famous in America in his time period. And basically, Sitting Bull, after his surrender, basically comes to work for him. And to me, it's almost like we turned him into a circus clown. Um, there's a famous sharpshooter woman named Annie Oakley. Uh, she's part of the act. She's a, sharp, she's a sharpshooter, and then she's a woman. And there's a stage play called Annie Get Your Gun. And if you've ever seen the play, and um, to me, it's, it's, it's not a very good play. Uh, they, they really clown up the Indians in this play. And it's really, it's, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame that things like this really still take place. Uh, and you know, I've talked to you guys before, you know, about this. And I know I'm putting this now on YouTube. But uh, 
the Washington Redskins. I mean, I think they should change that name. I think we should really come back and start thinking about some of the things that we've done over the 200 years and start to realize that it's time to stop a lot of this nonsense. Um, here's a picture of the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And as you can see, these young men, uh, their hairs have all been cut in the style of what would be white America, uh, having them wear suits to school. And this was part of their assimilation policy as well. Um, this, all of this becomes what they decide to do to Indians here at the end of the 19th century. But then later on, we'll talk about, as we go along, there's going to be Indian movements of the 20th century that will bring back their culture to them. And uh, things will change, but it won't change for all Indian tribes in America. And that's some of the things that I'll talk to you about, again, as the, in the coming months. Uh, now, this brings an end to this video lecture. Uh, thank you for listening. And again, remember, you're to use the older video logs, the, the more generic ones. I don't have a specific one for this. And this one will be due in class on Tuesday. All right, well, that brings me to an end, and I'll see everybody later.